In this video, let's go ahead and see if we can find the real and complex solutions given a polynomial equation. Starting off, let's just go ahead and rewrite this equation. And that's going to look just like this. Then since we're trying to solve this equation, we want to go ahead and set it equal to zero. So if we go ahead and add 25 to both sides of this equation, we're going to get x cubed minus x squared minus 20x plus 50 is equal to zero. All right, so now that we have this equation in standard form, Notice how the highest degree of this polynomial is three, so we're gonna be looking for three zeros here. And because we set this equation equal to zero, we're essentially gonna see if we can find out when this cubic polynomial is gonna cross that x-axis or find those x-intercepts. Now with these cubic polynomials that have four terms, it's always a good idea to go ahead and see if we can factor by grouping so you can group the first two and the second two, but I think you're gonna see here that that's not actually going to work. You could factor out x squared from that first grouping and have this x minus one, and then you could factor out, I guess, uh, negative 10. So you can factor out negative 10 as a GCF, and you're gonna get two x and then minus five. So while we could uh, group and then go ahead and factor, notice that we don't have anything that matches. So we can't actually factor by grouping here. So if that's not going to work, I think we can go ahead and use uh, some of our rational zeros theorem, and then go ahead and see if we can use some synthetic division to find some zeros here. So to use the rational zeros theorem, we gotta identify what our p-value and our q-value is gonna be. So for the rational zeros theorem, we have p. Uh, p is being represented by the constant term here, so that's going to be 50. And then we have q, which is gonna be the leading coefficient, which is going to be a one here. So if we don't see anything in front, that's a one, so we have q is equal to one. Now from this p and q, we can find the ratio of all of their uh, factors, and that list of factors is gonna let us know the list of possible rational zeros that this polynomial equation could have here. So p is going to be all the factors of plus or minus 50 over all the factors of plus or minus one. Now since we're just dividing by plus or minus one, it's really just gonna be the factors of plus or minus 50 here. So go ahead and think about all the factors of 50 and then go ahead and write them down and make sure you write their plus and minus version as well. All right, so hopefully if you go ahead through all your factors of plus or minus 50, you're gonna get a list that looks like this. And so if we're gonna have a rational zero for this equation, it's gonna be on this list here. So from this list, let's go ahead and start trying out some of these possibilities and we can use synthetic division to go ahead and test these out. First things first, let's go ahead and take all of our coefficients here. So we're gonna have a one, we're gonna also have a negative one, we have a negative 20 and then a positive 50. So we go ahead and write those coefficients down and then we pick one of our possible rational zeros to try. Now, which potential one of these possible rational zeros should we choose to start with? Um, I don't think plus or minus one is actually going to work here. Just looking at the numbers that we have, we're trying to get basically to negative 50 because we have to add a 50 to get to zero. And I just don't think a one is gonna get us there. So you can try it, but I don't think it's going to work. Uh, and then we have this plus or minus two. Uh, same thing, I don't think it's gonna make as much sense to do here, but maybe we can try it. I think it at least doesn't make sense to use the ones, but maybe we can try two. And then I think we can go up from there. But I think using 25 or 50 is gonna get way too big, especially with those exponents. So um, I think it's going to be maybe 2, 5, or 10. So let's start with maybe just using a positive 2 here and then go from there. Alrighty, so let's go ahead and practice our synthetic division here. So first things first, let's just bring this first number down, this 1, and then 1 multiplied by that 2 on the side, that's going to equal 2. And then negative 1 plus 2 is going to be 1. Uh, 1 times that 2 on the side is going to be 2. Uh, negative 20 plus this 2 is going to be negative 18. And then two times negative 18 is gonna be negative 36. And if we add these, we see that we're going to get 14, which is not what we're looking for. Again, we're looking for this to be zero. And since it's not, then we know that x minus two is not going to be one of our linear factors here, or two is not going to be a zero. Let's try another one of these possible rational zeros. Maybe we can try five here, okay? So let's go ahead and put a five on the side. First things first, let's bring this one straight down. So we're gonna have a one here. One times five is going to be five. Negative one plus this five is gonna be four. Uh, five times a four is going to be 20. That's really nice, right? Negative 20 plus 20 is going to be zero. And then five times zero is going to be zero. And then unfortunately here, 50 plus zero is going to be 50. So that's also not going to work because that's a remainder. Again, we're looking for the remainder here to be zero. So because it's not here, we know that uh, five is not gonna be one of the zeros or X minus five is not gonna be one of our linear factors. This did come out to some pretty nice numbers here though. So maybe we wanna go with trying something like negative five. So let's go ahead and try this negative five out and see if we have some better luck here. I bring this one straight down. Let's go ahead and put that one. One times that negative five is gonna be negative five. And then this uh, negative one plus negative five is gonna be negative six. And then negative five times negative six is positive 30. 
negative 20 plus 30 is going to be 10. And then negative five times 10 is gonna be negative 50. This is looking good. And then 50 plus is negative 50 is gonna be zero. Alrighty, so we found an x value, which causes this equation to equal zero, and that's gonna be x equals negative five. And so if x equals negative five is gonna be one of our zeros, then the opposite of negative five is gonna be positive five. So we know x equals five, this linear factor, is going to be part of our factored form of that cubic polynomial that we had. In addition, if we take a look at these three values over here of this one, negative six, and 10, the importance of those numbers are that they are going to tell us what we're gonna have for the other factor of this cubic polynomial. So that's gonna be one x squared, and then it's gonna be minus six x, and then it's going to be plus 10. If we were to go ahead and multiply this linear factor of x plus 5 by this quadratic factor of x squared minus 6x plus 10, we're going to get that original cubic polynomial that we started with. All right, let's go back to our original problem here and see what's going on. All right, so here is our factored form for this cubic polynomial, and it's still equal to 0. We know from looking at this linear binomial that x equals negative 5 is going to be one of our zeros. So let's go ahead and focus our attention over here on this quadratic expression and see if we can find out when this would equal zero. Now, first things first, you wanna see if you can go ahead and factor this trinomial. And if you can do that, then finding the zeros is gonna be pretty straightforward. So if you wanna pause the video and try and do that, then feel free to. And then if that doesn't work, I feel like a lot of people go straight to the quadratic formula just because they have it memorized. And while that's gonna work, it is pretty time consuming. But for this video, I'm gonna go ahead and use the completing the square strategy, just because A is equal to one for this trinomial and also B is an even number, which makes it quite nice. And hopefully this is a good refresher for you if you needed to remind yourself how to complete the square or just brush up on it with this practice problem. All right, so how do we complete the square again? Well, first things first, we're gonna go ahead and just group the first two terms together. This x squared is a perfect square. I'm gonna take this minus six x here. I'm gonna go ahead and leave some room though, cause we're gonna put something else in here to complete the square. And then I'm gonna go ahead and leave that plus 10 outside the parentheses. That's gonna be perfectly fine. And then we're gonna write equal to zero. All right, so what's gonna complete the square here? So what we do to complete the square is we take half of this B term. So this B term is six. If we go ahead and take half of that and then we square it, that's always going to complete the square. So half of negative six is going to be negative three. If we take this negative three and square it, that's going to be positive nine. All right, so to complete the square here, let's go ahead and add nine to both sides here. I'm gonna go ahead and write plus nine inside the parentheses. Now, if we just added nine technically to the left side of this equation, we should also add nine to the right side of the equation so we keep things balanced, all right? Now, if we take a look inside, this is now a perfect square trinomial because we completed the square. And so if that's the case, we should be able to write this as the quantity of this X minus three. It's, again, that's gonna be half of the B term and we're gonna square it because again, this factors into two of these x minus three binomials or x minus three times x minus three. Then we have this plus 10 on the outside here and go ahead and just copy down that plus 10. And on the right side, zero plus nine is going to equal nine. And so if we go ahead and take away 10 from both sides here, we're just gonna have this x minus three in parentheses raised to the second power. And that's gonna be equal to nine minus 10 on the other side, which is gonna be equal to negative one. Right. At this point, you do want to notice why we weren't able to factor. It's because of this negative one. The next step we're going to take is we're going to take the square root of both sides and the square root of a negative one is not going to be a real number. So we weren't going to be able to factor anyway. Going ahead and taking the square root of both sides, we're going to be left with this X minus three on the left side. And that's going to be equal to plus or minus the square root of this negative one. Now remember the square root of negative one is going to be I. So we have X minus three is going to be equal to plus or minus I. And then if we go ahead and add three to both sides here, we're gonna see that X is gonna be equal to this three plus or minus I. So the two values that are going to make this quadratic trinomial equal zero are going to be three plus I and then three minus I, two complex or imaginary solutions. All right, so putting this all together, what do we have for our solutions? Remember from earlier with synthetic division, we found out that negative five is going to work for X. So X equals negative five is gonna be one of our solutions. And then when we dealt with that trinomial, we found out we couldn't factor it and we could have used the quadratic formula, but I chose to use completing the square here to hopefully use it as a good refresher. And we found these two solutions, which are imaginary or complex. And so we can say that X equals is three plus I and that X equals is three minus I. 
And so hopefully when you look at these three solutions, you can kind of visualize what this graph is going to look like, uh, this cubic polynomial. And if not, I'm going to go ahead and just put that on the screen, but feel free to pause the video and make a quick sketch to see if you can kind of get the right idea behind what the shape of this would look like and how it would look in terms of where it crosses that X axis, as well as maybe those end behaviors that you might have been practicing as well. Since there's not a lot of space here, I'm going to go to the next page here and the graph would look something like this. This location right over here is going to be one of our solutions where we had x equals negative 5. So the point here is going to be negative 5 comma 0 for the x-intercept. And then notice this graph doesn't cross the x-axis a second or third time just because our other two solutions are complex. And just for some extra credit, if you want to think about what the end behaviors are, you can say as x is approaching negative infinity, what is f of x doing? Feel free to pause and think about what that is going to be but f of x is going to be approaching negative infinity because it's going to be going down as we're going to the left. And what about when x is approaching positive infinity? That's just asking what is happening as the graph or the x values are moving to the right and the y values or f of x values are going to be approaching positive infinity. So that's going to be in this direction. And then for some double extra credit here, while I'm not going to go into all the different intervals for domain and range and increasing, decreasing, just some quick intervals of when this polynomial function would be positive or negative. Uh, we can say that when is it going to be negative? That's going to be uh, before we hit this point where the x-intercept is, because negative is talking about the portion of the graph that's below here. So for the negative part, we can say that's going to be on the interval of negative infinity up until that negative 5 value. Remember, we need to put a parenthesis on negative 5 because at negative 5, it's not negative because the function is equal to 0. But then once we pass x equals negative 5, it looks like this polynomial is going to be uh, positive from there on out. It's never going to go dip below that x-axis. So for the interval at which this polynomial is positive, we can say it's going to be a positive as soon as we pass that negative 5 value. So put a parenthesis there and it's going to be positive forever after that. So we can put a positive infinity. Alrighty, so I know that was a little bit unnecessary, but hopefully that was some good review as well. Uh, but the three solutions we found out were this x equals negative 5. That was going to be one of our real rational zeros. And then we had two more that were complex or imaginary of this 3 plus i and 3 minus i. Uh, the first thing to do with these types of problems is to see if we can use the rational zeros theorem and come up with one of these factors. Once we have one of these factors for a cubic uh, polynomial, then we just are left with a quadratic and hopefully you've done a lot of practice with quadratics and we can go ahead and use one of those strategies to find out those other zeros. So hopefully you found the video helpful. If you did, please consider giving the video a thumbs up and sharing with a classmate or friend who might also find it helpful. And as always, keep up the great work that you're already doing.